yes, take a breath and maybe find your center. And as you breathe and just tune in with yourself coming from your day, And also just invite you into your open heart. You know, I've been gushing, bringing this dream of mine, the touching, the way I've been touched in my open heart from Tamara over the past 10 years. It's such an honor to bring this here and to have other open hearts to be in this dialogue, be in this medicine conversation with. Um, it's like, really a dream come true for me. So thank you all for being part of that dream. Um, and I have the great pleasure to introduce Barbara Kovats and Martin Winyecki, my friends from a Tamara, but I'm going to pin because I think that's the way to make you all big. And I think I can pin myself too. Um, and um, great. And I actually see uh, my teammate Dan here. So I'm going to also make him host and that'll make me a little bit more present. But as I'm doing that, I just want to say, welcome, Barbara. Welcome, Martin. Um, I'm going to do my best to um, introduce you. I don't have your bios um, in front of me. I'm sorry um, about that. So I'm going to go off of what I know and just trust, and then you can add anything that you want to add. Okay. We're just trusting the flow here. Um, and so first, I'm going to speak to Martin because he was my actually first contact point. So Martin has been at Tamara a long time, like 15 years now. Um, and he is, he came when he was quite young. And I think Martin, you came from more of the like leftist kind of Marxist worldview. And I guessing found something in uh, Tamara that felt maybe a bit more sturdy and really maybe met you in your longings because you, you uh, decided to uh, stay and you've been, at least when I was there, you were running the Institute of Global Peace Work, the IGP, which is where you're both calling in from. Um, you have been writing, you had actually um, edited a series of essays that I had read. That was my first contact point of really coming into the frameworks and research of um, Tamara. And I know you've been also holding a lot of the online, um, on, uh, the online coursework the past years. And I think you've also been part of stepping into deeper leadership there now, which we're going to get into. So welcome, Martin. Then awesome. I want to welcome um, um, with Martin, Barbara, Bori, uh, Kovats. I think you've been with the project almost since the very start, is what I understand. Close, close to the very start. Um, and I know that you've been a leader there in many ways. You've been leadership in love school. You've been leadership in um, ecology. Um, I think when I was there, you were holding a lot of space for like community forum practice. Um, and really just in my experience are one of the like deep anchors also as a, also as a elder, uh, woman of really what I've heard is backbone of the community at, uh, Tamara, really a group of elder, uh, women that you are, um, a part of and holding space for. So I just want to say it's really an honor to have you here as a as a um, elder, as somebody that's been doing this peace work for so long. That is such a gift for all of us here. Um, and just maybe say thank you. And is there anything you want to say upon um, arrival? And also, there's maybe a prayer either of you want to kind of open our time here with. Thank you for your words and welcome to all of those faces and souls that I see now in small squares, but I'm aware that there are whole universes sitting behind those squares. So I welcome us all into a common space and um, Maybe again, we take a moment just to, to be with each other and to be with the fact that we are now connected via an incredible technology. Some of us, I mean, when I was young, when I was a child, I said, imagine what it would be if you call a person and you even see this person, <laughs> you know? 
I'm from this uh, generation where you took and then you dialed. This was dialing. So we are connected via this incredible technology. And I thank for this. And may we use our time to go come into a heart to heart uh, connection about what has been portrayed in the film. And thank you very much that this film exists. And the name Village of Lovers, we've tracked back, is um, coined by Charlie Rainer Ehrenpreis, one of the founders of this project, who passed. And so I also greet his soul and may he be present with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious also to hear your questions and to be able to come into a meaningful exchange. Hmm. Thank you, Bori. Yeah. And can everybody out there see me also? I know that they're pinned or can you all just hear me? You all can see me too? Okay, great. Um, figuring out we just switched from talk studio to Zoom. Okay, I see it now. Um, well, thank you. Well, I want to start off with some uh, questions here and then we can get to the questions of the rest of you all here. Because um, for me, it's really an honor. I haven't really spoken much with people from uh, Tamara since we made this film. And I think, you know, the biggest question and the thing that we always, always uh, start out our, um, our um, Q&A sessions with is trying to share a bit more about what's happened in Tamara since we've finished filming. Because in some ways, the Village of Lovers, although beautiful, and we really trust what we have uh, transmitted, um, was from a different era almost of Tamara. And a lot has happened since the people also ask us about like, well, what about the, the like shadows? And it seems that you've had quite a confrontation as I think we all had during COVID, right? It created that time of a different kind of container for all of us to really face ourselves. So I'm wondering like, what did you encounter in this COVID time? What did you face? Like, what is that story and where has it brought you to now? Who starts? You. Okay. <laughs> um, how to answer? Let us let us find our way into it. Um, I think what um, what we are in at the moment as Tamera is indeed a huge transformation that started, started uh, showing itself in COVID times. I, it was present long before that also, because uh, we shared uh, this afternoon, but before COVID, we were in our routine. We had things to do. We had a guest season running. We had our yearly routine. And when COVID hit, we had the, the possibility at the present and also the challenge to uh, to not having to have this lockdown, to not having guests. And by the way, to mention this, we had this huge privilege that we had a donation, that we had a money gift. So we really did. We were not in. We were not in fear about our existence in this sense, um, because we uh, our financial flow relies a lot on that we can host guests that we couldn't do in COVID times. And uh, <clears throat> and this time brought, I think, time where we, we realized how much we are not in real communication anymore with each other, where, that we are uh, not really aware what the other would, uh, what, the, uh, what other people would say, this is our vision. Also how much, um, how much we didn't, we didn't attend to a certain transmission that is needed from the founding generation. I regard now myself as being part of the founding gen generation. Although I did, I was there, let's say 10 years after the project has been founded more or less to the younger generation, 
so uh, the what what have been the radical experiences we did in the in the first years and did we did we succeed to transmit um what we think and what the results have been of this of this research to the younger generation who has not been through these radical experiences as we have been so there is a breaking point that only can be filled when there is a huge trust bridge of for the communication available and all of this um was very tangible and very feelable in COVID times. And it was like as if we would look at an internal situation because we, we were not busy running a system anymore. So this is how I would explain. And then what I always also think is that we are not the only community on this planet <laughs> and we are not the only community in huge transformation also. So when we look at Oroville, when we look at Findhorn, also at Damanhur, all these big communities, I'm not aware of the situation of the farm in US. Mm. So communities that have been founded as a consequence of the 60s movement, they go through breaking tension. So, and, uh, and internal, really internal breaking points, I would say. And what I think Tamera is in is a huge transformation. And at the moment, we have the feeling that we are not going through, uh, towards a breaking point, but uh, we are going towards a way to find each other, to navigate. And what our favorite word for this is to co-hold the situation. Yeah, long answer to question. <laughs> yeah. Do you want do you want to speak to it also? Uh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree with uh what Boris said. Um and maybe just to add that you know, I think COVID was a time, I think on a global level where so much like hidden shadow material yeah. was coming up. Um that we were kind of hiding under the routine of our lives and yeah although as Bori mentioned like we've been in a huge privilege mm. in this COVID time of being on the countryside but also having this received a big financial gift the biggest we mm. actually ever received just yeah. before so it was um, an incredible gift to spend this time together nevertheless uh, as we were spending this year and it was almost funny because for many years we've, we've been talking we should do a year without guests like to mm. really focus inward and to be and then the world gifted it to us and we didn't know what to do like we were actually um we were confronted with ourselves and so it felt like a lot of the things were just also of tensions and conflicts that had been brewing in the community and that hadn't been dealt with were coming up and one that was definitely the tension between the founding generation and the younger generations and also a sense of not really understanding each other or a sense of the young people haven't understood or not, um, not sufficiently integrated what the founding generation um, developed both as a vision and also as community knowledge. And then also the other way around of a sense of like the, from our side of the founding generation um, isn't open for um, changes that are necessary. Um, but I would also say other other attentions. Um, the, the majority of people in Tamara is from Germany or German speaking countries and the the what that has done to to people also Portuguese people that live here, but also just uh, people from other other countries um, access to intimate spaces to um, the at the time we had a carrier circle, so a decision making organ that was actually made up entirely of people German speaking. Um, so also intention, I would also say almost like on a class level of like um, people who are working on on the material basis on infrastructure and didn't feel sufficiently seen. So, so a lot of these kind of internal issues um, came up. Um, some of us started reviewing how does how has how has race um, shaped um, the way we are, we are seeing the world? Um, why is it that 
Tamara, but also many, so many other intentional communities are largely inaccessible for black and people of color. Um, issues of um, queerness and LGBT uh, coming in, um, creating also this tension of like, um, what is the project about? Is it about the love between men and women or healing love in general? So these have been conversations that have rocked the community. Um, and yeah, part of it was also, as all these issues are also in, of identity politics are also tied essentially with issues of power. Um, and so we've seen kind of the, the, the collapse of the decision-making structure that we've had and had a year actually without an official decision-making structure, which was also an interesting experience, <laughs> um, which I think we actually navigated with at this point, quite some solidarity. Mm. Um, and then coming out a year ago, starting an experiment of two years with a distributive decision-making um, approach or governance approach. Um, and I would just say that in 2021, so after this one year of being kind of secluded just among ourselves and noticing we are running to the edge of, of breaking down or breaking apart. We started a process of saying we need to come together and create a space to see each other, to also have conversations that are difficult to have. Hmm. We also brought in external help, um, facilitation um, and holding um, by a collective called Nonviolent Global Liberation, Miki Kashtan, she, she will also speak on the summit. Mm. And from there, we have, I feel, a, a movement started mm. of, of, of saying, let us, let us counteract a growing polarization of different groups within the community that can no longer talk with each mm. other. And so we, yeah, and, and from there, and, and last year, April, we, we, we came out creating this new decision-making organ, which for me was an important step, and I think for many of us, of, of consolidating, of actually realizing we can um, find a, a new mode of, 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 of being together. And for the last year run as a, um, a group that we call the co-holding group, which is 40 people that are saying we are, we, we are taking responsibility for, for shaping Tamara and for figuring out these questions together. So this is now a very rough surf through the process on a, in terms of timeline, but also some of the issues that have surfaced. Mm, yeah, yeah, thank you. And I'm okay, good. I'm back. Thank you, Dan, for doing the back end. Wow. I mean, just first, I'm taking a breath of gratitude. I mean, having gone there, coming from the states where some of these issues are more prevalent, I guess, or they're more on the surface and they're more kind of like they have to be the bedrock of community conversations. There always was a tension, I bet, I think for me and Julie and Ian and others coming of like, oh, love Tamara so much, but they don't quite yet, not really addressing the like LGBTQTI issue or the race issue. And yet also for me really learning and witnessing you the right pace of those issues coming in to build trust. Because what I heard you just say to me that was so powerful is counteracting the polarization. And that because right now we're living in a, like, maybe you're not living, many of us are like living, and I'm sure that Tamara is nested within a global civilization that seems to be getting more polarized. Um, so I'd love to just like kind of tune into that point, because it could have been so easy, just essentially becoming a war between the founders and the next generation leaders. And that happens so much. Like I've heard that the a succession of leadership is one of the hardest things for a community to really go through. And if that can happen, that can become a model for how that can continue to happen, right? But it didn't really need to happen yet. It was all the founders that were still there, still alive, still able to kind of hold that kind of space. So I'm wondering like even more uh, specifically, like, and I know that you research this so deeply. So also from that lens, like what are the maybe more archetypal patterns you saw playing out that was creating this polarization and what needed to be shed or what needed to be shifted 
to counteract that? And what tools or processes did you actually use that seemed to work if there was any like specific tools or processes that really allowed that shift? Maybe I start. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so when you ask about uh, tools and processes, first answer that comes to my mind is at a given moment, I believe it was a decision in many of us, uh, the decision to, to say, do we want that Tamera goes into this direction that we see many other communities also going and that we see the world going to? Do we really want to go into this polarization and to go into this internal war? Um, or do we believe in our own peace vision that there must be an, uh, a navigation that goes towards solidarity, towards understanding each other, towards spending time to listen to each other? And I think this decision has been made individually, but it is also a decision that is in the field that we said we, we don't want to let um, these patterns rule, rule our community. And it's also, one thing is also when the conflict comes up, the, the, let's say the pattern of the conflict is, uh, is also that first, the standpoints have to be very clear. <laughs> and you, if you did the, uh, if you find something new, you are very clear that this is now the new thing and that- That the other ones have definitely did not get it. Not, <laughs> they, they did not get it. And those who come with the new, they did not get that the old ones, you know, we have loads of experiences that they don't have. So they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> So uh, this was also a time we went through, no? That mm -hmm. we, uh, that positions, you can say that it was a time of polarization. You can say it like this, but it never, maybe it is also because of the task of our project that is so much about peace and about mutual support that uh, there was a moment where I, th where I felt that in the collective, it was now we need to take care that this doesn't become a pattern that rules us, but that we again rule our connections and our world. Yeah. Um, you asked many more mm. questions that I forgot already. I can also- Yeah, maybe you continue. Continue and then, and then see. see if there's yeah. more. I would also say that it, like from a developmental point of view, I would also say that it's Mickey Kashta in one of the diagnoses she gave us is that we are a very conflict avoidant community. So I think part of it was also an important developmental step to actually surface these tensions and, and, and conflicts. And I think one of the, um, tools or ways that we brought in or that have come into Tamara um, has also to do with grieving or mourning. Yes. Um, so, so to actually to actually acknowledge the the what is left behind or the, the pain that is accumulated. I think that there was a lot of it and I think there was also a pattern of um, and it's just even with the film like um, I think in many people touches this dream of a different possible world. And so Tamara also, I think, got a role of like, we are, we are upholding this dream. We are mm. hope carrier. This is how many people refer to us. And then it, 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 it becomes hard to, even to oneself sometimes acknowledge the places where this is maybe not fully true or where th there's doubt in oneself. And, mm. and I think, and, and I think, I, I, I noticed that a lot has, there has been a, um, a softening in, in um, or an acknowledgement of complexity of different truths can be there at once. Mm. And also, mm, 
the, the principle of integration, I think, was one that has uh, along this line is, is also important. It's also one that we that we try to pra practice with the in the decision making structure, which I think was also an important point mm -hmm. of like how do we, because this was it was an awkward situation of like coming from a from a structure where there was a a, a circle of 15, 20 people um, that was that was taking most of the decisions, and then. Do we do we just default into into a kind of consensus structure where we, we have like huge group discussions about every single thing and and actually coming to to a structure where we um, where we empower people to raise their voice but we are we are not allowing kind of the, the veto um, to of of one or few people to block the whole community and rather to work towards integration. Than to, um, I, I think I'm not making myself really clear, but this, this principle the of- The principle of integration. Yeah. We don't have to go into, in, into decisions mm. making structures. It is the principle of integration in general, no? Are we, are we saying that's us and you don't belong? Or are we saying this is the core and let us integrate yeah. what is there? Right. So I yeah. Think, I think we've been learning different skills. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, there, there's something I see in that that I kind of wanted to tease apart. That for me has been such a profound part of what I've seen from Tamara, and elsewhere in my life as my path has uh, unfolded. Is because what I'm hearing you say in integration is what is it to really allow a space for different voices and even hurts conflicts to be there. But it's not necessarily that those then are the drivers of a decision making. And that, as I know that Tamir has done a lot of work of like stepping out of war is to step out of defense, is to step out of, at times, a victim consciousness. But the danger of that is then creating a space where you, could, you essentially could gaslight actual victims, right? And not have space for the hurts and the like grief. Mm -hmm. And yet, though, and somebody actually um, asked this in the chat, it was um, Florian asked about, like, how do you deal with these social justice issues without following their like shadows and had the comment that Tamara really has done work around women's liberation or feminine or female liberation without following the shadow of feminism, right? And that is experienced a lot here in my country. And really, I'd say now globally, there's kind of this shadow of wokeism. And I kind of saw, I also saw, um, and I can help you explain, Bori, it's like trying to be too politically correct. And I actually saw Tamara being really resistant to anything politically correct, but that was actually then creating a resistance to actually looking at race, right? And mm -hmm. actually looking at like the issues of queerness and other things. But there is that fine line where it becomes then like this tyranny of the of the like pain body and so i'm wondering as you as you explored these really tense places really vulnerable places what was your experience of creating space for the hurt but then not having that completely take over and still being like okay and yet we're still going to move forward and yes we welcome your voice but they're also we're not going to have that totally always and maybe at times it is right i don't think um, there is one way but what i'm hearing is that you weren't going back to like a consensus a decision making model and if somebody was hurt that they could veto the whole process right but you still included them so i'm wondering about that kind of both and dance that maybe you learned something about in this process <laughs> complex dialogue you are trying to put uh, to bring here um, oh, what, what I can what I can say is for me it is always helpful to really go back to this very very to this to this question, when we now speak about are you politically correct and how do you include different uh, definitions of identity and so on, is to go back to learn to 
slow down and to go back and see the other as the other, to see the other as a human being and uh, to see the other as a soul that is on his or her or their search to make a humane, to, to contribute to the shift that we are in. And when, I'm, when I really succeed to be there, then I can fully embrace every, every need that this other has. Then I'm not there with the position, yeah, but it should be like this or it should be like that. I mean, liberation of fear, uh, of love, free of to free uh, love of fear means to means also to free ourselves, to free our soul of fear, because our soul is, I believe, made to love. And if we, and I think we as humanity should, if we want to go towards peace work, we need to take care that we don't foster any system that creates fear. May it be the so-called right system or the so-called wrong system. And for this, we need an inner attitude to really invite the other and to really invite... Um, uh, perception. Perception of the other. Hmm. Mm. It is a practice of trying to uh, to to be uh, to um, you have to translate for me civil ungehorsam civil to, disobedience. Um, to, uh, to practice civil disobedience towards all the systems that try to box us. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So just picking mm -hmm. up on two lines of the question. Um, so with the with the vetoing and the decision making, I mean, this is a common pattern mm -hmm. in a lot of intentional communities that um, of like trying to be inclusive and then ending up with a, I think Frederick Laluc calls it a tyranny of of, of, of the ego or something mm -hmm. like where the, where the space where actually all the different um, topical conversations are getting hijacked um, and contaminated by an emotional underground. Um, by people who are actually not feeling seen. So, and, and, and then the financial, financial debates or whatever it is are becoming then the battleground. And um, at the same time, in designing this new approach to decision making for us, it was important to actually acknowledge it is important that there is the possibility to say no. Like if, if, if I cannot truly have a choice, if I cannot, if I don't have the possibility to say no, um, there is a there is a peer pressure that will um, that will push me along, um, but at the same time, for us, it was important to do that in a way that actually encourages responsibility. Like, if I say no, am I ready? If I veto, am I ready to be part of um, making it work? Like, will I be part of a conversation to bring in my voice to integrate it? Um, and then what we noticed also is that um, part of it is encouraging the voicing of concerns. And actually, this has worked very well for people to feel in every, like, not in every decision, but in the decisions that impacts the community significantly, there is a possibility for everybody to bring their voice. And um, so, so much of it actually has to do with um, creating trust that what I have to say will be included and heard. And... I think that also refers a lot to this question of um, the broader question that you're bringing about what identity politics, where I think there's often this pattern of uh, people from marginalized backgrounds bringing experiences of oppression, that creating a backlash in people with privilege and power um, because it creates a fragility um, where the, 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 the striving of marginalized groups for equal rights is seen as a threat to our societal stance now ours as I'm a white man with coming from a lot of privileged positions um, and as long as I feel that I feel as long as there is not an acknowledgement of power and of the structures of power and privilege by those who hold most of it um, of course there is an experience for people from marginalized backgrounds that their 
experience is not really heard. And so there is a, there is a constant kind of feeding off one another, a dynamic. Um, and it's, we, cannot easy, we cannot just say, yeah, it, it is your pain body taking over. Um, but at the same time, of course, like when the, 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 the struggle for equal rights is, is fought with, with blaming, with shaming, um, it, is, it will be defensiveness on both ends. Um, and how, how have we done? I mean, I also feel we are not done with it. I feel the conversations are still pretty much, there, there is still a lot of tensions around these issues. I also don't want to kind of sugarcoat it. Um, but I feel that the more um, spaces we could create where people who actually have experiences of marginalization can share them, can, can really um, can share their experiences in a way that they are they're being seen with their experience. I think that is a key. And also creating more consciousness around structures of power and privilege and how they, how they function within us, I think is really important. And to create practical steps to, towards more equity that where we, are, where we are not with every tiny step having huge ideological debates, but actually trying to make practical decisions that can work. Um, like we had, for example, this, this whole conversation of like, do we, do we create a possibility for people of marginalized identities who visit Tamara to be able to give feedback to us? Mm. And, and, and when we had this, this proposal, then the huge debate, like, do we want, and, 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 and all the, the things came up. And in the end, it was actually a work of how do we make this practically work? Mm that includes, it's actually a good example, that includes the needs of the people who feel this is a very important, um, it, it's very important for us that we offer this possibility and for others who feel afraid of exactly what you, what you spoke, um, this kind of um, a blaming energy or, an, or um, a, a possibility for people to accuse us to, to come in and to, and to do that in a way that actually um, serves both these needs. And I, and I think we managed and it was, because we wanted to make a practical, we, we worked on a practical level. Kind of. um, hmm. Yeah, I'm also noticing it's late on this side of the world. So I'm not, <laughs> I don't feel fully no, sure. You're, but, you're, um, you're, you're doing yeah. great and I can, I can help pick it up. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question to get to some questions from the audience, which is, it's on a, it's on a similar vein of this both and kind of thinking, which I really think is, part of what I found at Tamara that works so well, which is around leadership and the shift from power over to power with. Um, cause I'm, cause certainly when Tamara began just, um, unconsciously brought in some of the same colonial power over patterns as it was striving to do something new. And there still was, central leadership at some level, even though there was more like circling. And I've seen what I've heard is more of that shifting to even more horizontal styles of leadership. But the question I have is that it still seems to be that there is a need for leadership. So I'm wondering, like, how is Tamara finding out in this shift of like, what is a new type of leadership that still is leadership, but really holds more of that power with energy? And like, what are you seeing wasn't there prior that is becoming there now in this transition? Okay, I go first. Mm -hmm. no. Um, no, it's just interesting because we've, we're, we're right now having this conversation and I think it's, it's an interesting learning after almost a year of, of having a more horizontal decision-making structure of, of realizing how leadership and decision-making is not the same thing. And I think it's also one of the traps of um, horizontalism of, of thinking that, um, which I think has less to do with inclusion than actually with fear of like holding back and um, just trying to, um, in order not to insult or possibly hurt anyone, they kind of play it on the lowest uh, common denominator. Mm. Um, and I think, I actually think that a truly distributive 
system needs a lot of leadership because the 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 conditioning that that people that everybody that has been kind of socialized into a power over system carries is a kind of accumulative centralized structure um and 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 the the way of getting out of it is is not to not want anything so we don't hurt anybody which i I think is, is a pattern of holding back leadership, but it would actually be the other way around of like going for what we want, but learning to do it in a way that is transparent, um, that is inclusive. So, so it is, um, I think it is, and, and actually, um, yeah, lead, to learn leadership that, that truly creates trust. I think this is, this is kind of, I think that, that, is, that, is, that is a key. Um, and for sure, like to do decisions in a way that, I mean, this, this I also see as, as a key for trust, like, um, hmm. in part of our decision-making structure, what, what we learned, like we, if, if we make decisions, the people that are affected, the people that have knowledge, the people that have resources to do it, they need to be included. But I think it's also, what is really crucial is, is part of the more traditional knowledge that Tamara has been holding for, for, for decades is, if we truly want to shift to a to a, um, a a genuine democracy, we we also need to make the layers visible that are behind the formal levels. Um, so so to make the inner workings visible, and and this I think is also a key. I mean, this we see in all the community processes, like people who really want to step into leadership processes, uh, in leadership positions. Need to be the most transparent people like they need people need to know like what is what is actually moving in their heart because otherwise you cannot really um you don't really cooperate and 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 then you wonder like um is it is it is it what they truly mean or are they running a different agenda and and you can only and this i think is, is part of the beauty of the of the spaces like forum of like making visible um what really moves a person or where you can a space where you can really see the other. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to add more. I, for me, the what where you started off know that decision making and leadership is not the same. Mm -hmm. I think this is a huge, this is a very important distinction. Because leadership, you can also say, it is a little bit stupid, when you really want to save the world or if you really want to make a difference on this world, to not acknowledge that there are people that know more than you and that they please take the lead in this area. Mm. So, um, uh -huh. it is in, at the end to accept leadership is for me also a, a huge question of trust. Mm. It is that I accept you know more in this area and when I trust Martin, then I know when he speaks up in this area, I don't need to withhold. I can fully listen. I can fully orient also myself. And there where I know more, he orients towards me. So it is this system of uh, leadership that is not fixed to a person. You always are the leader, but there are areas of knowledge where you definitely are the leader. And I sometimes also think the peace movement lacks courage to lead mm -hmm. so it because it's also if you start to lead i don't know many of you probably know this experience when you step up into leadership position you also need to know how to stand for what you stand for in a soft and firm way the same uh, the same the two the two qualities together so that you can hear the feedback and still stand for what you stand for. Mm. 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 Yeah, there is a huge learning, I believe, for all of us in this. What is what is authentic leadership and what is leadership embedded in a trust community? Yeah, and how to, yeah, I think this is a huge mm. learning for all of us. And of course, in the last, uh, let's say, the founders, you know, the, the people that could be my parents, my fathers, th th there is a generation when they found something and they started to 
they they put it out as a new finding, like Sepp Holzer for in the ecology, or Jürgen Kleinrechter in technology, or many others. They stood up and said, "People, this is what I saw," and they got so much resistance. So they also learned to say, "Go out of my way. I have another idea." And uh, now, and this had this was needed back then to have this uh, to to clear the space. And now that uh, it's it's the time to turn into a circle, and um, a very dear. Uh, friend and also teacher of mine, his name was Mani Tongkwat. He defined the circle way, he, he defined the circle way as the way that functions only when everybody is a leader. Mm -hmm. It will not function if you have leaders and people that are not leaders. So a circle is a circle when everybody in the circle knows that he and she uh, is responsible. Yes. For what happens? Yes, that that for me is so beautiful. Um, I don't know if you all. There you go. Um, and I remember feeling that at uh, Tamara, and we actually talked about some of that in some of the other um, some of the other interviews that we didn't have in the film was about the individual being a community enterprise, and really that I think the goal or a function of healthy leadership is really empowering each individual to take responsibility where they can. And that creates a circle, not just of decision-making, but a circle of um, responsibility. And I, I think would... that, yeah, please. Sorry, I just wanted to add one, two more points, mm -hmm. which um, I think one difficulty also with leadership and trust often is the difficulty of feedback like as the more social power a person holds the harder it often is to to feedback um either be, because it is there is a there is a conditioning of 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 powerlessness or um yeah social social structures that that guard and this was also an experience of of the last years of like how do we create how do we support creating feedback structures that actually help um, establish communication flow to, 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 to create more trust. Um, and then the other thing I would also just say is that how to be a leader in a power with structure is also like for me, it was also to review my own conditioning into a power over paradigm and my, my conditioning as a man in patriarchy, as a white person, white supremacy, um, there are particular messages that I have absorbed, which, regardless of my intentions, have often oozed out and been seen as arrogant by others, and I don't understand what they mean, but it, 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 it creates certain impacts. And so I think there's also something in that of how do we do that um, in our work to, to understand what, are the, what, are the, what is the conditioning that is driving me. Totally important. Yeah. A good um, leader needs to know yeah. him or herself. Yeah. This is a very, very important equation. Yeah. And I think community can be hugely helpful in that. If mm. there's a shared decision, then right. these are the issues that we are working on. Mm. Well, and I'm also feeling the sense of like, you know, uh, a dear elder and friend of mine up in Canada, Elfie wrote in the chat, uh, consensual hierarchy and transparent hierarchy and I'm also feeling like a flexible hierarchy because I think there's also the agility to also receive that feedback around maybe our blind spots or our um, conditioning in real time. And then maybe also recognize like, wow, as a leader, I need to step back for a moment to digest this new information that's coming. And I think often in systems in like community or elsewhere that ability to be flexible in leadership isn't often there. And I think that there's that necessity for me is part maybe more of like a real community function. And I think that actually gets to something I really want to speak of, which for me is that kind of the uh, like foundation of what Tamara is doing that to me as a filmmaker and as a, as a um, anthropologist is so profound 
which is really creating a space of emergent leadership. And what I mean by that is that I've really seen at Tamara because of the coherence and the trust field that the community at times becomes this one body that can receive guidance, for lack of better words, can receive leadership from a different source. And actually, Elfi also was commenting on chat around what about going to the land? And I'm wondering, and that actually brings up the issue even of like ceremony, because I think ceremony is how indigenous peoples and our ancestral peoples and really is a very human way of coming into that coherence, I think, to receive revelation. So I'm just wondering how that played into your process and how maybe Tamara even spiritually evolved in that sense during this leadership transition or during this rite of passage you were like in and just what have you learned or how do you practice even receiving leadership from this emergent space of creation from mystery and like how that process has continued to evolve I would, maybe I start, yeah. we develop the answer together. <laughs> um, my first sense is that uh, it is a question that becomes a collective question at the moment. It is not there that we say, these are our practices, but it becomes, an in, it has been an individual question. It has been a very strong question to myself also. And now we are, we are just searching, we're just starting to search what, what are collective, collective rituals, collective ways to pray, to open up to spiritual guidance that feel authentic, where you don't feel now you are, I am in a new church and I again have to struggle and I again have to fight against a set of rules that are not mine. Um, I do believe that we start with that we will come up with something or let's let's put it the other way around what what um, what is already quite a rhythm that is installed is we have a day where we honor our ancestors mm. and this is a this is a day and a, re a practice that the whole community is part of. And I'm sure that we will, that we also have the Global Grace Day that has been a practice, a political and spiritual practice. But you see, I'm, I'm hesitating. I, I, there is not a thing that I say, yeah, we developed a, a, a practice that is in line with the cosmic rhythms and where we, where we, where we tune into, um, into the larger cycles of life. Many of us have their individual practices. And as I said, we have a collective practice, we have a collective, collective question arising with this. Mm. And as you all so probably all know, um, one of the founders, Sabine Lichtenfeld, she is a hugely spiritually anchored person with her vision and her whole path. And she is very, uh, very much searching for the question, what are European indigenous ways uh, to hold sacred space here in Portugal where we are, where we don't take practices from other cultures or where, where we don't take practices from the culture that we come off out of, which is uh, the, the let's say the layer of church or the layer of religion, let's put it like this, the layer of religion that we want to overcome. We don't want to reinvent a system that two generations later, again, is a, is a set of rules that doesn't serve life. We want really to, 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 to find ways to go in contact with the sacred where everybody has this, this possibility to access the sacred. And that we do this together. What an, what an endeavor when I speak about it now. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm. Are there things, Martin, that you want to add? Mm. 
maybe just a different angle because for me this image that you offered of a group that coheres with one another and then becomes this kind of emergent organism um, for me is also very much a leadership principle that I, that I believe in and love and um, and yeah, I think spiritual practice is really important for this, like as a, as, a, as a foundation, like to create a kind of permeability and openness in people to, to actually form this, this shared organism. But I also think it has a lot to do with, with how do we navigate community and are we, are we working kind of linear agendas or are we, are we open to, to, to being in emergence together? And, and we had an interesting experience last year with coming together people of the younger generations um, and we, where we experimented with a, with a kind of rotational leadership um, structure um, just as a way to really listen to the group body and after just a few days it, it really felt like capacity was multiplying because the, the, the group was coming together and there was this kind of this bubbling of, of, of creativity and it's it's not even so much for me about method or what is what is the particular practice, but it has to do with the, with the, with the, with the willingness to to remove barriers between one another, to speak truth, to lean in, um, to have the real conversations. And and I feel like when when we break through to to a level of um, putting the stuff in that really matters for me and and. Um, going to this to this level where you know like community is needed on an existential level mm. um, and not just on a level on, on on the surface level like if we approach it in that way then I feel we can become this organism um, that then is um, creates answers or, or creates processes that otherwise could not be planned and this is a very a, a, it's a very interesting way to be in life um, because there is often this flow where then you're not just communicating even among humans, but mm. you have the feeling that life itself is, is, is somehow working. And I think for many of us, um, and also what I hear with Bori, is that there's also this sense of we need, and especially those of us kind of coming from a Western socialization or culture of like, we, we need to, to, to learn how to become part of land and to, to, to root with earth more. I mean, Bori could say a lot about the messages that come from from animals and in relation to that the work she's been doing um but but i also feel that um and i think we are still yeah you spoke about it but there's also a shyness and there is a there's also a historical awkwardness of of of, of doing that kind of re reconnecting to what are the ways um yeah. and even here we live on the countryside but many of us are coming from urban backgrounds so it's I mean, you know, it is also a huge question of trust. If I now say to you, um, I connected with the sacred matrix and I have the feeling we should do this and this, this is how it is according to the sacred matrix. You need to trust me that I don't want to impose another mm -hmm. sacred uh, set of rules onto onto a group of people mm -hmm. so it is for me spirituality is as much bound to trust as sexuality mm -hmm. it is um spirituality without a clear trust relation between humans is is um is verdammt <laughs> is uh will 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 run up mm. uh in will run into all systems that we want to overcome like, so yeah i mean you just create your protective yeah. spaces just yeah. as you do with love relationships yeah. because you cannot trust that it's actually received and shared yeah mm. just uh, maybe i share and then i also would love to hear mm -hmm. questions from the from the audience mm. But I share this moment that we had when we aligned here before we mm -hmm. went online. We were doing a little prayer together. And um, after the prayer, no, in the prayer even, I said, um, I feel Charlie present. And 
after the prayer, uh, Martin said, I felt him also present. And innerly in my inner, there was uh, the, the spoken answer by Charlie, this would be normal. I mean, if we really believe that the beyond world is as present as we are here, if I feel him present, it is logical that he also feels him present and that we can communicate about this. And when this happens, then I feel we are in a new spiritual world. No, then we are in a spiritual world where we accept, mm. where we accept the invisible, where we accept forces that go beyond what we normally can explain. It was it was a microsecond, but it was it was a very powerful mm. experience. I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's so good to hear just the research that you're in and yeah coming back to really i hear that place of the willingness to slow down to really be transparent and then build trust that way and from that trust something else can emerge and you know one question actually that came in an earlier talk that i want to bring here is he asked for questions from the audience um was one from my friend who i think is actually here on this call um really for me around Eros, because I think that Eros has so much to do also with the sacred and with that kind of unlocking of that potential to touch more of a collective place of guidance. And I know Tamara has done so much work on liberating Eros, so really like liberating this truest life force between you all. And in many ways, that's looked like having more in the West, what is known as polyamorous uh, ways of, uh, of like partnering. And the question my friend had was, do you have to be in like more of an open, uh, in a more open relating way to really build a village? Like, is that, is that really what it, what it, what it takes? And I think this kind of gets to the heart of like, what does it really mean to liberate Eros? And does that look any one way? Does that mean polyamory is the like way? And that's how you build the trust and then the like authentic truth between people that leads to both community and this deeper place of collective guidance? Or like, what does that actually mean, I guess? Like, what is the liberation of Eros path been like at Tamara? And what do you continually learn uh, with it now? Wow, people, what questions are you asking? <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> um, maybe we start this way around and then we find our way into it. Um, let's say the intention around liberating Eros is the intention to, to, um, to allow true ground between human beings. So it is not uh, a question of lifestyle. Do I want to have more lovers or do, I, do you want to have more lovers? It is, um, it's not the, on this level lifestyle question. It is a, a question of, Am I willing to really uh, to really ask who are you? Who are you um, in this case, man? Who am I in this case, woman? And how do I want to love? How do I desire? What is my body telling me? Where does lust come and when not? Am I willing to take this as a, as a base as a, as sacred? Am I willing to take this as sacred and to protect it and to defend it and not let any rules of society go into this and grab it and say, yeah, but you should, uh, you should desire only one person or you should desire only this way or that way. It might be that polyamory or to love more than one person is not true for some, for some people. So, you know, for, truth is for me the key word. Truth and trust are the two key words and not any other system. 
and not a system of how we should relate to each other. Yeah. And from there then, and th this is for me the entry point why uh, a truthful, let's say a, a community or a model that can, that has to, uh, that researches truthful relationships is a model for a trust community and is a model therefore for a possibility to live without war. There this inner connection is between the very, very intimate work we do with ourselves and when you scale it up into the globe into to the global situation. Yeah, so this is how I would I would um, how I navigate this. And again, now you asked questions that I didn't answer. Mm. Maybe I give to you. I can try. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree. Um, it, it's not I, I think there are many different ways um, probably, I hope in the end, there are as many love images as there are people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I think, like, in, especially in Western mainstream culture, there is so much like this, the monoculture of, of, of what a perfect love life should look like. And um, it, it looks like you're married and you have many <laughs> hidden lovers, no? This is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think. I mean, somebody wrote in the chat like Eros is living intelligence. I actually think that's true. Like there's, there's something if, but but under patriarchy, it has been the source of so much suffering because the 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 inherent life force and truth that is in Eros couldn't actually be appreciated. And so, if we can create a, if we can create communities that can actually hold erotic truth, it can become this this organizing principle where. It can unfold from the inside out, mm. and then it, it creates exactly. it creates a stable basis of, of social structures instead of that which it is right now. It is it's this it's this it's the latent tinderbox that can go up at any point when mm. the when the when the truth comes out when the structures that are covering it up are no longer working. Um, and I think what that looks like in terms of how it it expresses itself, it it also changes. Um, and but I, but and I also think that there is a um, yeah like I and mean, we had this conversation today of like the difference between kind of polyamory in a in an atomized mm. society where people are on their own and then managing their relationships with with agreements with between one another and being in a community where people experience. Um, have a fundamental experience of acceptance mm. and and of supporting each other and how that is a, it, it it just creates a different dynamic of being at home mm. primarily in a community and then on that basis the questions of acceptance in love relationships are different and i think this um i see it as a as a as a principle that I mean, universal is always such a hard thing to say because we will have to see what mm. emerges in terms of culture. But I think it, it, it that is a principle of, of organic communities that I think will be in, in, in many different cases. Um, and I think part of it is also to create consciousness, like to create a political idea of our mm. inner world, like um, to understand what is the power of life within us and what are the forces of oppression that have kind of put it into boxes in order to make it governable and to split the, also the inner world, the human psyche up into opposing forces so that with this divide and rule structure, be, people become governable. Um, I was just writing an article about the, the Kurdish movement and um, there is such a strong women's liberation focus in the, in, in the Kurdish movement. And, where they, where they say, for example, our um, our liberation begins with the understanding of our oppression, and and where where the where the Kurdish women are doing so much study on the structures of patriarchy that are destroying um, their their power, um, and and I see that also, and I see that actually as a very inspiring um, contribution, um, because we. Of course, we can always look on an individual level 
how am I happy? How do I get my needs? Um, but as long as we are not understanding that actually the forces that rage inside are uh, collective, cultural, mm -hmm. historical forces, we're actually trapped in a place of inferiority to a massive global field that is hard to deal with if we are not if we're not if we're not seeing it on the on the appropriate scale and so, and and I think that is that is a cultural task of of, of creating a, a realistic context of what we are actually dealing with. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, and I, and I think there are like um, every context is different, but I think there are principles just like in permaculture <laughs> that. You know, every 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 landscape looks looks different, and you cannot you cannot have a a list of recipes mm. to to kind of just impose a template. But but you if you have certain principles that that sharpen your perception, um, then you know in contact with what is true. Mm. Right, and I think that's that. I think I'm really seeing just the link between you know truth and eros and emergence that place I'm talking about where there's that partnering with like life. And I think that, yes, there is a lot of wounding and a lot of um, historical forces involved with Eros. And that is such a key area then to really find again truth. And, you know, kind of to weave in some of the questions here, I've heard Rosemary asking about economic uh, disparity in the, in the world and under a privileged paradigms. And just that, you know, there's a sense of privilege to be able to do a intentional village in Portugal or in the States. And yeah, I know that Tamara has been really for me, what drew me to Tamara was this intersection between really the work of love and Eros and our deepest longings as human beings. Cause at least for me, it was like, I want love. I wanna be in love. And then the intersection with the existential crisis that we are in and for me, what was profound about Tamara was really having a global vision and that you had dared to think through what would global healing look like. And yes, that can have the shadow of saviorism. And I think Tamara's dealt with that. And, you know, I've been inspired by this vision of healing biotopes, which we talk about a bit at the, at the end of the film as one possible part of the bigger complex web of global healing that no human, no even group can fully know, but that having different acupuncture points of really living research models, trying to create the most, I'd say, in harmony and trust-filled culture, these greenhouse of trust. But I'm wondering, you know, that was the vision you were carrying from Dieter for a long time and working on. And I'm wondering, what is the vision now? Has that vision shifted? How are you in relationship to the rest of the world, knowing we are in this existential poly crisis of so many things happening? Like, how does Tamara see yourself as part of that? And what is the vision that you're carrying now that maybe has changed, but maybe it hasn't? Um, so to answer your question my vision didn't change it is uh it what i can realize is that the vision is in uh happens in different contexts the times has ha, have has changed that this vision is connected with i mean um and also that um the state that tamira is in has changed so i see what work it is to create a to create a cultural model that that meets the criteria that is, are um, are said when we say a healing biotope. What huge work this is <laughs> to to create this greenhouse of trust you named it, and. Um, I think what we what is different at the moment is we deal differently with the gap between the vision and the and the state we are in now. And what I what softened in me also is I do believe that every 
also every one of you that is now on the screen makes um, certain decisions that that nourish the field of peace. So if if I work with the field theory, then every the, every single decision, every single thought, every single possibility that I have that where I have a choice and where I choose truth and trust uh, over exploitation, over power over, I nourish and I, I nourish a field, I nourish a possibility and I nourish the strength of peace globally. These are nows. I know it sounds a little, it, it is whoa, big words, <laughs> but, um, but yes, at the very end, I do believe that this is the power that we have. And this is the power that a community can have when individuals that think like this uh, come together and form a community. And this is also the power of a, of a global movement where we know that there are many people on this planet that work in this direction. And when we join forces, <clears throat> we can amplify our uh, the the um, yeah the impact that we can have yeah mm. and also really to say here <laughs> at this end of the planet I, if our planet has an end it's yeah, a round it's, thing it's, that we are living I, on I doubt it actually <laughs> yeah. uh, it is late <laughs> so we are also getting tired. <laughs> Or I at least, and I'm a person that is in bed since two hours normally. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Want me to go, sir? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually think that my vision has changed um, in some ways. I still think that healing biotopes are really important. Um, like I, I in, in a way, I. For me, that is not so much to doubt. Like I, I see healing biotopes as really crucial or even indispensable ingredients for system change. Um, but I also feel that I mean, you mentioned the saviorism. For me, this has been an has been an important review of, in a way, what are the what are the images or the thoughts with which that vision gets communicated or the motives that are getting activated in me with which I am bringing it out into the world. And does that actually serve a vision or, or um, does that actually serve the healing that I want to bring or does it channel images and, and, and powers that are actually to be healed? And um, yeah, so what, what shifted for me was that I, back when the film was done and I gave this interview, which do you have to clip in of me of <laughs> talking about healing biotopes, I felt much more that like um, healing biotope is kind of the, the core thing that counts. Um, it, it's, this, it's the absolute center of, 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 of social transformation. And while I, while I can continue to believe that healing biotopes are super important, I see more um, the need for I call it an ecosystem of transformation. Like I, 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 I think there are um, really important, also large scale social movements in the global south that in many ways are leading the transformation on the planet. Also that we in the north can learn a lot from. Um, some of the most radical social transformations are happening in the, among the groups that have been most marginalized and oppressed by the current paradigm. Um, so this is also a shift of orientation. It has also to do with contexts that have grown in the last years, for example, to the Zapatistas, the Kurdish movement I, I mentioned. Um, and I would also say that um, I think that healing, as I see healing biotopes, I see them as these kind of, as the, as the social and spiritual catalysts for a, a societal transformation as, like creating a, a peace matrix, especially in, in how people come together on a, on, a, on a deep cultural level that then opens up possibility 
Um, but if we talk political change, economic change, ecological change, it cannot just be an isolated, standalone community of 200 people. Like it, it has to be on a bioregional level. Um, we see this also here with the water and in the, in, in the film, you see these beautiful full lakes. We've, had, we've been hit by, by drought um, for six, seven years in Portugal. And we also see the limits of the work that we've done on water, as long as these kind of methodologies is just applied to 140 hectares that Tamara is. Like we are now investing a lot of work into how do we bring this to a larger bioregional scale. So I feel also our, our political practice is already changing in that sense of realizing um, as a community, we need to be more together to strengthen our spiritual core, to strengthen our inner work, but with a political orientation of actually helping to create a bioregional alternative. And, and I see this is, maybe this is not a change in the vision, but it, it, I see it as a change in the political practice that, that, that wasn't so strong before. Yeah. Um, and I see that then strongly being in solidarity with, with other movements mm. and as kind of global capitalism crumbles and as it will get a lot nastier in many ways, I think having a tent of solidarity of strong lines of trust and solidarity between different movements and then anchored in places where people kind of hold down a strong work of trust and spiritual connection, I think this in, in my vision, this, I see it as, as a possible pathway where this collapse can be a portal into, into a different culture. Hmm. Hmm. And still this, the, the essential work that um, Dieter Doom and other people in the founding generation so strongly described as um, creating a, a different field of culture in connection with the sacred matrix of people who actually align their lives in as many areas as possible with that healing force of life. Um, for me, this is totally true, and I and I think this it's 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 something without which we will not mm. make the pathway through the portal. Mm. 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 Yeah, thank you both. I mean, what I'm really hearing, um, I don't know if I can see myself again, but what I'm really hearing is um, a more fundamental capacity and willingness to really partner with life with other communities and understanding that there'll be different edges of research different edges of new information and healing information that come based on how collapse is happening in different places on planet earth and that there is a global context and it will be local and bioregional efforts and yet we do need information because we do need i think a global coherence at some level. And I know that Tamara has been holding space for that as well. So it's been long. Our time is pretty much at its, at its end. I think it's 10 PM there, maybe um, 11 actually. Um, wow. So, I mean, I want to give it to you both for final closing. And then I want to say just a few final things. Um, actually, maybe I'll, I will say them now then pass it to you for the, for the last words, which is first to say, thank you both. Thank you, Bori. Thank you, Martin. I mean, we've been grateful to partner with you all for the last 10 years. And we want to really partner more. We're really hoping this is a restitching. I feel like we, I feel like we needed some time away to really find our own vision, our own story of you all. Um, and I feel the desire to collaborate as part of this global movement building. We have an online school um, platform. That's where we're going to host a bunch of content from the film and dialogues, hopefully have some of you back to talk. And we also, I put in the chat a link to Tamara, you're having an online course, a introduction to love school that Uri wanted me to share. So I want to say just please inviting all of you all, like certainly our online course is great, but Tamara's straight from the horse's mouth, um, you know, and different, you know, because there's something different we're carrying as filmmakers of 10 years of really integrating this with other systems of like knowledge. And there's something profound of learning from um, Tamara. So um, we're gonna have a whole nother day in Eros uh, tomorrow. So I wanna invite all of you out there to come uh, tomorrow and the day after for our final day. But 
now to end this talk, which has been so beautiful. Thank you both so much. Is there anything you both want to say as this final words in um, closing? Mainly just gratitude for you, for the summit, uh, for everyone who joined and listened. It's especially beautiful to see known faces and also people that we don't know yet. And we hope to, yeah, see you in the online course that starts in 10 days. And also we will open in April. Um, so yeah, let's be connected and also yeah, even if we don't see each other, um, to build this web of community yeah. Um, as a, a yeah as a, as a work for for raising culture. Um, and thank you, everyone who is in this work, and for all your care. I mean, for you being on the summit, I think is already a sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank yes. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, so much. Um, well. Have a beautiful night, beautiful dreams. And we look forward to seeing many of you uh, tomorrow and catching up, Bori and Martin, with you both soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day or have a good night, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs>